I know we've talked several times in the last like two weeks about anime that involve people's anuses, but trust me, this is, it, it gets better. Usually when you see a film by any particular creator, you might know what to expect. Creatives in general have a style that they like to lean on in, in many cases, and chances are that if you like one film by them, then the rest that they make will also pique your interest. The films and work of Masaki Yuasa, though, I would not say follow that same trend. While you can look at his work as a whole, and you can find similarities between the different projects, the style and the content of his works change drastically from project to project. He's a rare kind of filmmaker who's not normally bound by traditional limitations of others in his field. He doesn't seem to have any limitations on what he thinks animation is or what it can be, which allows him to create works that are hard to describe in simple fashion. It makes him a combination of both niche and unmarketable. It's hard to really recommend his work to people. Like we keep trying. Of course, there are several projects of his that he's he's directed that I have lovingly mentioned to friends that they should watch whenever his name is brought up. And heck, I know that most people have been praising his most recent work on Devilman Crybaby, and it was even highlighted as anime of the year at last year's Crunchyroll Anime Awards. Of course, that's the same award show where he won Best Director, an award presented by some idiot who doesn't even know how to do a proper Kotaro Tatsumi cosplay. Because you're not supposed to use the sleeves as sleeves! It's not what he does! Freaking Philistine. So it would be easy enough to just lean back with a glass of scotch and say, Well, he's just an artiste. And just call it a day. But, since I haven't yet, I wanted to actually take a bit of a gander at his filmography to see how he's changed a bit over the years, and more importantly, to showcase his particular way of doing things and why his work is so enjoyable. So, ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arkata, and today on Glass Reflection, we are taking a brief look into the history of Masaki Yuasa and his films. Let's jam. So where's the best place to start? Where it all began. Mind Game is a film that is both surprisingly simple in narrative while also being, and I know this might sound contradictory, incredibly complex. It follows the story of a young man, Nishi, who, after being unable to save his childhood friend from a bunch of gangsters, gets shot in the ass and sent to the afterlife. Despite being told by a being referred to as God that all that's left for him to do is to walk towards the end and disappear, Nishi is driven by a desire to no longer be the wimp that he was his entire life and decides to run like hell in the other direction. And in a way, he never stops running for the rest of the film. Yuasa has stated in interviews before that one of his many inspiration over the years has been among many things the 1968 film Yellow Submarine, and Mind Game, more than any of his other works, I feel, is where that inspiration shines through. Many of the events in this film don't make logical sense, and they're not supposed to. You could cut out over half of this film and it wouldn't harm the narrative that's just loosely strung together over its 103 minute runtime. But watching the base narrative is not really the purpose of this film. It's an experience more than anything else. The animation style is never consistent, starting off with what could almost be described as chicken scratch, and then mixing that in with some live action photos plastered on 3D shaped faces. Then there are larger and more detailed 3D models and entire sequences where it just looks like they might not have bothered with a key animator if this was a lesser production. Yuasa has said on multiple occasions that, I originally thought that if I made something I found interesting myself, everyone else would find it interesting too. But I discovered that often wasn't the case. Mind Game is an example of this. 
As much as it has over the years since its release in 2004 become a cult classic, even beating out Miyazaki's film Howl's Moving Castle for several animation awards that year, the film just didn't really connect with an extremely large audience. Even today, it is an odd film. But there's nothing else really like it. Following up from Mind Game, we now lead into the next little era of his work in television. And we're only going to be talking about this briefly because I did mention before that I only really planned to talk about his theatrical works here today because otherwise we could be here all day. And it is worth mentioning that in all of the years between Mind Game and his next theatrical feature that he didn't just disappear into the wilds. Far from it. You know, even if it did look that way from a Western viewpoint because we didn't get much of what he did. This instead was the time that he spent on the small screen. He directed works such as Kaiba in 2008, Tatami Galaxy in 2010, Ping Pong in 2014, and of course, there was also Devilman Crybaby in 2018. All of that interspersed with working both in the East and the West, with animation in Samurai Champloo, as well as directing episodes of Space Dandy and a particularly memorable episode of Cartoon Network's Adventure Time. Despite the critical success of Mind Game, it was still his debut work as a director, and as such, he wanted to further experiment and develop his directing style, which working in television allowed him to do. The key work here that I did want to focus on before we move back to the theatrical was the series Tatami Galaxy. Since for me, this was my first big exposure to his work following Mind Game. It's been hard to recommend this series because of its abstract content, but outside of his theatrical work, it's the project of his that I have most enjoyed watching. And I'll probably do a video on the series explaining exactly why you should watch it, but until that time, know that Tatami Galaxy exists, I love it, and if we weren't trying to be a bit more concise with this video, I would probably just dedicate a whole gigantic section to it alone. However, I am not, so we are moving on. Now we jump ahead, far ahead, to 2017. After many years of staying out of the theatrical realm, Yuasa moves forward with not one, but two brand new theatrical films. The first is on a bit more familiar ground. Because wait, did I just not say that we weren't going to be talking about Tatsumi Galaxy? I lied. Really though, this is more of an addition, or a sidestep, if you will. As Night is Short, Walk On Girl is more of a spiritual sequel to Tatsumi Galaxy than anything else. You obviously don't need to have seen Tatsumi to enjoy or understand what is going on here. Though again, watch Tatsumi Galaxy, because it is great, and you should. The film itself is split into multiple different plot lines that all apparently occur on the same night in sequential order. A young man is desperately trying to figure out a non-embarrassing way to confess his feelings to his kohai. Though so far, the best that he has been able to do is just, to the casual observer, come off as a bit of a stalker. He constantly runs into her so that she might start thinking that their meeting up was not coincidence or some plan by him, but in fact, fate. Unfortunately for him, she has quite a few other things on her mind. Well, that and the luck really isn't with him on this particular night, and the vast majority of the film has the two characters separated due to a variety of circumstances. The Kohai herself spends most of the film on a kind of an upbeat adventure through the town, meeting new people, trying new experiences, and generally living the best life possible while helping out whoever she can along the way from having a drink off with a supernatural being, performing in a traveling theater play for the local university, and nursing the entire town back to health when a very nasty sickness begins to spread. If all you were to do was to look solely at Yuasa's filmography, you might begin to notice a bit of a pattern with his work, but also a remarkable improvement. Much of his work utilizes animation in very nonsensical ways. A lot of things like to happen on screen, and by and large, not a lot of it makes sense out of context. This is especially the case for Mind Game, but here, with Night is Short, there's a lot more consistency with the ideas presented and how the film is split up. It's easier to notice that a lot of what seems to be nonsensical really isn't if you take a moment to to pause and try and see why things are happening. It's very easy for an artist to design and showcase crazy and insane imagery for a variety of reasons. And while they can be impressive from either an artistic or a generally creative perspective, having a kind of meaning behind it 
goes a long way. Now, of course, it's sometimes hard to identify whether or not an artist actually had any particular meaning behind their work, especially if they never tell you or describe it after the fact. It's very easy for, for us, the audience, to instead identify our own interpretation of the work and assume that that was the meaning all along, which I'm sure some artists use to their benefit. But in the case of Yuas's work, he's the kind of artist that uses crazy imagery for the obvious benefit of the character's development and the overall narrative as a whole. It's not just crazy for the sake of crazy, but it's crazy because life is crazy, because the universe is crazy, and sometimes crazy is the best way to showcase exactly what is happening in these characters' lives. This is why his work has become cult classics over the years and why the characters he brings to life feel like they have so much depth to them even when we don't spend a lot of time with them. Which brings us to his most recent film, Lou Over the Wall. Out of all of the films that I've talked about today, I have to say that this is probably the cleanest cut. Not that it doesn't have the same kind of Yuasa flair to it, of course. The narrative is easy enough to follow. It's a new take on a, a Little Mermaid type story with a young boy, Kai, meeting a curious mermaid girl, Lou. Through the music that they and their friends make, they attempt to reintroduce Lou and the world of the merfolk to this little fishing town that has legends devoted to fearing mermaids. Due to misunderstandings and other narrative obstacles, tensions begin to build that Kai and Lou have to overcome. And that's more or less the crux and, and the gist of the story. There have been many comparisons made to the Studio Ghibli film Ponyo, and it's not surprising given the style of animation, especially when Lou is present on screen, and it's not necessarily an inaccurate comparison. Though the narrative is far more simple and easy to follow than Yuasa's usual works, the good parts of the film are still the characters, and specifically how the animation is used to, to help further develop them, rather than letting the dialogue do all of the talking. And heck, a, a decent amount of the animation for this film was done in Flash. Flash! Ah! Like, I know the use of Flash in proper productions has been a thing for a good while, but to see it done this well in this kind of production is both impressive and inspiring. The reason why I really enjoy watching all of Yuasa's work is because his animation, unlike many of his peers, makes me feel like I am watching a waking dream. When you dream, Things can happen. Things that your waking mind can't explain. Locations blend, people pop out of nowhere, and situations can occur that, when you try to think about it the following morning, don't make all that much sense. But in the moment, while you are experiencing that dream, everything fits. Everything makes sense and everything is understood despite how weird it is, in that moment. And watching one of Yuasa's films is like living in that experience. But there is no sudden moment or, or, or time that occurs where the memory of that dream, the understanding of it fades into nothingness. These dreamlike experiences that Yuasa shares with us are things that we will keep with us far into the future for the hopeful benefit of our own lives. I won't say that Masaki Yuasa is the best director. I won't say that he's the most influential or even the one that we should keep tabs on. I will only say that he has a very particular kind of animation that he brings to the table, one that nobody else is doing and possibly nobody else can do quite like him. So that'll be it for this very brief look into the filmography of Masaki Yuasa. I hope you enjoyed. Very special thank you to our good friends over at GKids for sponsoring this video, as they are also the North American licensor for several of Yuasa's films. And you can pick up a bunch of those films on DVD and Blu-ray from them. And lastly, a very special thank you to my patrons, who not only support my work in general, but allow me to continue to do what I do. I love and appreciate you all. 
specifically, though, as I am wont to do, I wanted to give particular shoutouts to patrons Rifen Bonaparte, Rune Jacobson, Joshua Garcia, Calhoun Boy, and Siri Yamako for being especially awesome. You guys are great. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime and stay frosty.